Today our reading is from 1 John chapter 1 verses 1 to 10. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Thanks, Tom. Spot the person who needs a haircut, as do I, actually. I wonder what you think of when you think of the word fellowship. Here's a bit of a churchy word. Um, what's been your experience of fellowship in the church context? The second section of our vision document is all about our fellowship. So here at St Nick's we obviously think it's important and an essential aspect of our life together. We talk there about being the body of Christ, growing and building itself up in love that we're all different yet united, that we're all equally valued, that everyone can play their part. I expect if you're like me, you've had different experiences of what we might call fellowship. I think of a small group that I was part of for about 12 years where I felt that I belonged and we were a group who had traveled together for a little while, sharing life's joys and sadnesses, praying together, dipping into God's word together. And then I think of those slightly awkward conversations over coffee after a service, or times when nobody spoke to me, or a church when I'd been going for 18 months and then somebody still asked me if I was new. It's a bit of a mixed bag, and we probably don't always, I'm pretty sure we don't always, experience what the Bible means by fellowship. I wonder what you would say about fellowship at this time, because so much of it relies on us being physically together. My dad's in a care home locally, and I'm now able to speak to him via FaceTime as they've got some iPads. And it's great just to be able to see him, even if half the time the camera is directed at the ceiling of his room. I pray that at this time you are connected in some way and I realise that that may not be the case for everyone and we'd love to be in touch with anyone who is feeling particularly isolated at this time and disconnected from our life together. It's a challenge to think about our fellowship at this time as we're doing so up until Pentecost but it's also quite moving to be thinking about, about it at this time, to know that God can still be strengthening our life together, even while we're apart. Our fellowship, our sense of being together, is not confined to a building, but is a fellowship without walls, stretching across our town and beyond. In our reading today, 
John talks about two things that are at the root of our fellowship. The background to this letter is that John is writing to correct false teaching. But his first concern is to protect his readers, to reassure them, to see them stand firm in their Christian faith and life. For John, being a disciple is about being close to Jesus and then being close to other people. And we see both of these at work in this passage. Let me just let the dog in. In your bed. That's better, close now, settled. The first thing we find at the root of our fellowship is the life of the sun in verses one to four. John is wanting to be really clear about who Jesus is, that he was from the beginning, the word of life and the eternal life. Jesus, John says, is God. The eternal son who was there before and at creation, who was with the father and John says has now appeared. There was a moment in history when the eternal life of the son entered time, was born in Bethlehem, grew to adulthood and so could be seen and heard and touched. John can testify to this as an eyewitness and he proclaims it to others. Jesus is a real human, not a cardboard cutout, not some mystical figure that we can't see. John has seen him, listened to him and touched him. Think of all those occasions for John, listening to Jesus' stories, laughing with him, eating with him, watching him work miracles, looking at him as he bled and died, and then being part of those resurrection events. All his senses were affected by Jesus' life, touch, smell, sound and sight. The life appeared, John says in verse two, God with hands and feet, the life of the Son of God in human form. And that can be a great comfort to us at this moment, that there is no human experience or emotion that Jesus cannot identify with. What emotions have you experienced during this time? I know I felt things like stress, confusion, anger, frustration, joy, hope, peace. In the life of the Son, we find all these expressed. Take a moment to read the book of Mark at some time and note all the human emotions of Jesus that are expressed there. We are not alone. The disciples had the role of proclaiming this life, the life of Jesus and the life that he offers. We see that, that in verses three and four and they tell us why. So that others would join them, that they would have fellowship together. A fellowship that is first and foremost rooted in fellowship with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. As I cycled for my daily exercise this week, I wondered what is different about Christian fellowship because we do get something like fellowship from other groups, a sense of community and friendship from maybe something like a photography club or a book club or a choir. And the answer that I came up with was that Christian fellowship is rooted in something deeper. It's about the way we live our whole lives. It's not about how we spend a small amount of time on one particular day of the week. As John said, it is rooted in the life of the living son. As Christians, our fellowship with each other arises from and depends on our relationship with God. Fellowship with others is impossible without fellowship with God the Father and the Son. The Greek word translated as fellowship is koinonia and it expresses depth and intimacy and meaningful relationships. It's about relationships that are rich in quality that aren't superficial and it has elements of being very practical and sharing. It's used to describe that close relationship with God and our relationship with each other. 
in our desire to grow our fellowship at St Nick's, to care for one another, we must not forget that fellowship with God comes first, that we need to hear and see and experience the life of Jesus as individuals and together as we seek him. We are to be deeply rooted in scripture and in the gospel good news as the foundation of our life together. Our fellowship with one another comes from that. Right now we cannot be together and enjoy fellowship face to face. But John would tell us that there are still things that we can do to grow deeper in our fellowship. Take time to read the Bible, pray, walk closely with Jesus, dig deeper, hold on. Because the effect of that will be that we will build our fellowship as the people of God. And when we come back together, we will find a deepening of our fellowship, which will give us joy and spill over to those outside the church. So the root of our fellowship is firstly the life of the Son. And secondly, the root of our fellowship is the light of the Father. Verses five to 10. The message we have to proclaim is that God is light. Not just that he lives in light, but that he is light in the same way that he is love. It makes up his whole being, that's who he is. And so there is, and there can be, no darkness in him at all. Light is also about truth and goodness. So we could also say, God is good, and in him there is no evil at all. God is truth, and in him there is no falsehood at all. And as we follow a God who is light, the same must be true of us. We cannot say that we're in fellowship with God through the life of his son, if we're in fact walking in darkness in some way. Life doesn't just enable us to see, it helps us to see the path in front of us and to walk in it. And walking in that light matters. That we say we're a Christian is tested in whether what we say and what we do match up. We have to walk the talk. This week on the news we've heard of Professor Neil Ferguson who had resigned this week. He was one of the chief advisors to Boris Johnson around our current lockdown arrangements. And he had allowed a woman he's in a relationship with he's in a relationship with to visit him on two occasions in recent weeks and so breaking the very restrictions that he had been saying were so important to prevent the spread of coronavirus. It's an example of claiming one thing and doing another. And so with us, we cannot claim that we are living in close relationship with God and yet not reflect that in our lives. We can't have one foot in the light of God while the other is walking still in darkness. We can't live in that kind of compromise. We need to do all that we can to live in life and truth and rely on God's grace knowing that we all too easily fall short and live in the darkness of greed and gossip and selfishness and rage. But John, John says if we walk in the light then we have fellowship with one another. In the same way that we can't say we're in fellowship with God if we still walk in darkness, we can't walk in the light without doing so in the company of others. Walking in the light enables us to see God and also see each other. We are in the light together. Now, if I put on my sunglasses, things look a bit different for you and for me. It's difficult to have a conversation with someone who is wearing sunglasses. You can't see their eyes. And we often read eyes to help us with our conversation. And it's also as if the one wearing the dark glasses is wanting to hide. Christian fellowship is in the light when we see one another properly, when we love one another 
despite our imperfections and we're open and not trying to hide. For John it's very clear here that our fellowship occurs in the context that we are not perfect and we know that ourselves if we're honest. When it comes to our life together we're all in the same boat or indeed fellows in the same ship. We all need the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from our sin, whoever we are. And so it's a great leveller. Whatever salary you earn, whatever education or achievement you've attained, no matter how you have lived your life up to now, if you've concluded that you have not sinned or that you do not continue to sin, then you're simply deceiving yourself. And in fact, you're making God out to be a liar because he says that we need his help. We can only walk in fellowship with God through the sacrifice of Jesus, the blood he shed for us on the cross. But the good news is in verse nine, that in confessing our sins to him, he will both forgive us and purify us. And, and that's like removing the stain of what we do wrong. Now, Tom, who you saw earlier, he has cricket whites. And when he was younger, he used to annoyingly, purposefully skid on his left knee. And no matter how much I tried, I could never totally get rid of the grass stain of his whites. And I'm a bit obsessed about getting rid of stains. So each time I see this, it's a reminder that in some way I failed. Through Jesus, God not only forgives us, but takes away the guilt, the shame, the stain, the, st the sense of failure that sin leaves. And as we live in the light, we're able to have greater depth of relationship with one another. Now it's all too easy to think that fellowship is this sort of warm, cosy, easy thing, when actually the reality is often different. It's a bit messier. We have to work at it. We have to share our stories, be honest with each other and share our struggles. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor and theologian, and he was put to death by the Nazis just weeks short of VE Day that we've remembered this week. And he said that there were things that we needed in order to live in Christian community. We need to hold our tongues at times. We need to listen more than talking. Be willing to be uninterrupted in our schedules. Bear with one another's individuality, weakness and oddities and not seek our own importance. And in so doing, we would model what living for Jesus means and make it easier for others to see something of the good news. But of course, we don't get it right. And so we come back to seek forgiveness again and again. I don't know about you, but the more I go on, the more I see my own shortcomings, the things I do wrong, the things I get wrong, the things that affect my relationship with God and with others. And certainly living in this time of lockdown, it's been easier to see. And if I haven't spotted it myself, someone else has all too uh, readily pointed it out to me. It's not always comfortable trying to walk in the light as God chips away at our imperfections. The root of our fellowship is the light of the Father, because walking in that light means that we can have fellowship with one another. Right now, that's not easy. A bit like with the dark glasses, we can't see each other properly. But there are things that we can do to build up and grow deeper in our relationship together. If you're in a small group, you're probably already in touch with each other. If you're not in a small group and would like to join one, let me know. During this time, you may have discovered something new that you could offer to the church family when we get back together. You may have 
been writing your own prayers or taken up an instrument that you had gathering dust in a cupboard. Or you may have done some artwork that could be shared. We have a chance at the moment to value our children and young people as they've contributed so amazingly to our online resources. Many of us want to see more of them when we get back together on a Sunday. We can all join in praying on a Tuesday at eight o'clock in the evening as Encounter meets every week. We can think of ways of showing love and relieving each other's isolation. Maybe that's in practical ways if that's possible. Or staying connected, seeking forgiveness, sending cards. Perhaps when you think of somebody, when you find yourself thinking of them, pray for them or give them a call and be honest about your own struggles. Will reminded us last week of the confidence we can have that Jesus will build his church. And the same is true of our fellowship together. He can deepen it at this time. A fellowship that hopefully never was, but even more so at this time, is not confined to a church building. But may it be a fellowship rooted in the life of the Son, the life that he gave, the life that he shares, and rooted in the light of the Father, such that we will grow together even while we are apart. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the life of your Son. And we thank you that as we have life in him as our first and foremost foundation, we can then have fellowship with one another. And so Lord, may we walk in your light as you are light. And so may we deepen together in fellowship, even at this time. And we pray this in the Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. the king come and bow before christ the author of all things every heart adore christ the everlasting god reigning at the father's side from eternity wrapped in everlasting light clothed in majesty the beginning and the end
authority. Sin and death will be destroyed in his victory. We will see him face to face. Every tongue will cry in awe, every bended knee will acknowledge he is Lord. Then our hearts will be lost in everlasting grace. Stop.